Good morning. Welcome back to the Higher Grounds Podcast. Thank you for joining me on this good morning. Today we're going to be talking about the subject of transparency. The word transparent means, means to, be, uh, to, to be manifest or to be able to see. It also deals with the word earnest or being truthful or forthright. Uh, I think probably the best word to describe it would be that word forthright, being outright or forthright. And today we want to talk about the subject of transparency uh, in the preacher, transparency in ministry. And there are, there are two sides of this argument in regard to transparency, but today we want to title this episode, Being Real. And Brother Matthew Tucker, Brother Michael Poindexter and myself want to talk to you just for a few moments today about being real here at the Higher Grounds Podcast. Good morning and welcome back to the Higher Grounds Podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, as always, joined by my co-hosts to my right, Brother Matthew Tucker out of the uh, greater metropolitan Concord, North Carolina. He is the <laughs> Uh, reigning undisputed heavyweight independent Baptist champion of Concord, Cabarrus County. How's it going there, sir? It's going good. Good. Going good. Yes, sir. Who's your number one contender up there? Who's, uh, let's say you got Dr. Montgomery, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Simpson, all of them in that same area. Well, I think he'd take both of them yeah. at the same time. <laughs> uh, Falls County, anywhere in the building. Sir? Falls count anywhere, anywhere in the building. I know a whole wall. <laughs> <laughs> yes. oh, what about it, brother Michael? Well, Seagrove. Uh, Seagrove is is, right. is is still throwing out pottery. That's what I was. That was <laughs> yeah. in my mind. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. How's, how's the clay up that yeah, way? The clay's great, is and uh, they're still making it. You know, by the uh, cup. Yeah, by the cup. <laughs> you know, here, uh, here. By, the, by the vase. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Here. So it's good. Stuff. Seriously, if you ever get the chance uh, or opportunity at all to get into the Seagrove, North Carolina area. It's the, I guess it's the pottery capital of the world. <laughs> there, there, there's, there are, um, privately owned, private owned potters shops, um, in every nook and all cranny yeah. through there. And some of the most beautiful work you've ever seen. Of course, there are galleries and consignment stores with loads of pottery. I, I am a, I am a fan mm -hmm. of, uh, of hand made, uh, pottery, I just love it. And My wife has made sure the uh, over the years that uh, you know it, whether it be the guys who come and preach for us for revival or mm -hmm. Bible conference. A lot of times, there's a lot of preachers and preachers' wives who have uh, cups, you know, yeah. from our area, yeah. just as a way to remember us, pray for us, kind of deal. She's never given me one. Well, and on to the next topic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh man! Tell yeah. RB, I expect uh, you know pottery. Yeah. Are you sure what you mean? Because years ago when we were in the old block, then oh, you no. preached revival no, no, no. for us. I collect this stuff. I know where it comes from. I'm almost positive that maybe she's got one for Beverly. Well, maybe she did. Yeah. Maybe you should look at her collection. Maybe that's the one she threw through the window. Could have been. Yeah. Was it because of something you did? Uh, I was ducking. <laughs> <laughs> so it was intended for you. Yes, it was. Oh, it excellent. Was. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we've made up since then. I see. Excellent. It's all good. Mm. Well, we That's are talking right. about transparency. Yeah. <laughs> that is a topic. Look at there. Segway. Segway. Segway, it's segway time. That's right. An unplanned segway. That's exactly right. Oh, uh, he's getting it, smarter he's, every episode. He's sharper than he a broke. Pencil, I'm telling you. I'm right telling now. you what. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's good right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, from yeah. real good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some people like Matt, you know, it's it, you could have one good eye, a half a brain, and a broken pe pencil and figure some things out. Yeah. Matthew yeah. still works hard at it. You better believe he it. Too. He's a he fine does. fella. He is. Well, today we are talking about the subject of transparency. And some may say, what in the world are you talking about? I don't sound good. Uh, but we're talking about um, being real. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's a lot of facade in the ministry. I, I've always been intrigued by guys who, when they pray, uh, and if you do this, I'm, I'm not trying to offend you, but I am I'm going to. Um, when they pray, their voice changes. Or when they preach, their voice changes. And they become something in their expression of ministry uh, that's nearly performance art. Mm. And uh, in their life, it seems like uh, there's always, you know, this put on facade where you don't, you don't see that there's a real person. It's a, 
It's almost like an actor. And of course, the word for that in the New Testament would be hypocrite, um, an actor. That's but what it means. Um, we want to talk about that in regard to the life of Christians, period, and in regard to the life of a preacher uh, being transparent. How much is en- enough? How much is too much? Uh, should he be transparent? And we want to look at that today. And uh, so, that being said, let me ask uh, with transparency to my brother. How are things going in the Cabarrus County? Everything's going good. Good. Yes, sir. Everything but the the number band. Yeah. Covert. <laughs> oh. COVID nineteen. COVID nineteen. Yo, I got you. All right. The coronavirus. Right. Coronavirus. I got you. How about you, brother? Uh, brother Michael. Uh, doing doing well. Uh, years starting off uh, strong. I was going to say busy. Uh, the calendar was busy, but but uh, some things have slowed down a little yeah, bit. They have haven't they? Uh, circumstances out of our control. Um, but still, um, just uniquely finding ways to to be you know effective. And, I think uh, we're going to make it. What do you think? I believe we will. I, I think, think we'll make. I'm feeling pretty good about it. Yeah, I am too. Well, let's talk about that uh, transparency business. I, I remember, you know, growing up in a pastor's home. Um, and being around ministers and ministry, preachers, pastors, missionaries, evangelists, Bible teachers, I remember being around them, and it just it, a lot of times it seemed like they they weren't uh, they were held up as being heroes, and they were many of them were heroes, but it's almost like that they were beyond being actual people. It was almost like they were not real. Uh, does that make sense, Brother Michael? Yes, it does make sense. And uh, I, I want you to know that, you know, the three of us are preachers. We're pastors of good churches with good people, um, you know, not trying to hide anything in our life or live a, a duplicitous life in any way. And truthfully, there there is not an S on our chest, you know, and we're not wearing a cape beneath our shirt. Matthew may, but we don't. And uh, we want to we want to be we want to talk about just being real today. What's the concern there for you, Brother Mike? I know you see some of the same things I do. Well, I think more than anything when it comes to to the topic of being real, which in our day is a very uh, widely used phrase for what we're going to talk about today, um, I, I, I often ask the question, why do we as Christians feel the need to put on um, a presentation that we have everything buttoned up tight. I don't know why. I don't even have the answer to that question. I don't even know where to start. But I just know this right here. Um, when you think about what James said in James five sixteen, here's what James said. He said, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, I understand the most intimate context of that passage, but let me just say this. Everybody that's at this table, as well as those that will hear this podcast, you know people right now that are uh, that, that are Christians. They're bitter and they're sidelined, or whatever the case may be, from the cause of Christ or the work of God or the local church, right. because someone let them down. Uh, a preacher they had confidence in fell. At least that's the reason. They that's use. the reason they give. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, another believer, they see a hole or something in their life. You know, they're not, li- they're not living up to what the expectation is. But the question they rarely ever ask themselves is, do I live up to that expectation? Right. Uh, am I doing everything right? And I think what the scriptures are teaching us here is this. There is something healthy about being humble enough to recognize your own faults. Right. And then to not feel the need to make out to everybody else that you have got it all buttoned up. It's okay. I mean, our Bible's filled with scriptural um, examples from Genesis to Revelation of different believers, uh, heroes of faith still. We still count them as heroes of faith. Yes. Peter, oh man, I mean, when you study his life as a biography, I mean, look at all the mistakes he made. I mean, he, he was from time to time a right. mess. Still used greatly of God. Noah, great man of faith, okay, uh, made Hebrews 11. Uh, but still, he has he had, a, he, had a, he had an issue. You know, he had a black spot on the page. And I talked to our people about that all the time. I said, here's our problem in the church today. I said, number one, I said, we have, we're very scared of anybody knowing that we are, don't have it all buttoned up tight. Number two, we find ourselves so many times, even against scriptural, um, I guess you could say, admonition. We take an individual's life, and if it was a white sheet of paper, 
there'll be a couple black dots on it. And all we do is magnify the dots. Right. We've created some of this culture because inside the church, I understand why Matthew 7 is there now about judging each other. Uh, and don't do it unless you've examined yourself right. well. That is right. what the scriptures teach. Mm -hmm. But we have so, we have strained at so many gnats and swallowed so many camels um, in people's lives. We don't give room for God to grow them up. You know what I'm saying? Or, uh, you know, uh, I can't remember. It's in Romans chapter 14, I believe it is. There's a there's two brothers and, you know, one's got a conviction against uh, eating herbs and the other doesn't. And, you know, there's a back and forth there. And he said, don't 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 judge each other over those kinds of things. Right. Uh, you know, because he said, why judge thy brother? He said, you know, God's able to make him stand. And I'm paraphrasing here. If you see as a, as a fault in his life, and that it's hard to find that balance in a church and in your individual life. I'll say this. The older I've gotten, I've uh, been saved now for 21 years. And as a younger man, you know, brassier, you know what I'm saying? And and just uh, just everything was so cut and dry. Right. The older I've got, after I lived a while, I understand some of the things the Apostle Paul's talking about with the battle of the flesh. And seeing more, uh, as Isaiah did, uh, the, the own issues in my own life has made me more compassionate toward those others who were just like the rest of us, struggling on the wheel. You know what right. I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, trying to live the life every day and, uh, you know, skin your knees every once in a while, uh, fall down every once in a while. You get back up and try to go for God. And uh, But I think personally, uh, you know, some things that come to my mind, I think about Moses in the Bible. Moses got weary. You know, yes, he, he wasn't did. a superman. Yes, he did. Uh, he didn't even hide that weariness. Luckily enough for him, some other brothers saw it and come alongside and lifted his arms up. Amen. Secured the battle. Amen. Okay? Amen. The Lord Jesus... He got tired. Yes, he did. And when he did, he slipped off to the back of the ship and went to sleep. And I think the thing about it is, is even, you know, when you consider examples from the Word of God, uh, we have got to change the culture where people feel like they have to live a facade. It, it is okay if you're struggling to call someone in your inner circle close to you and say, help me pray about this. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, what would your counsel be about this particular issue? I'm, I'm just not doing well. Because if you've, if you've got legitimate or real friends, uh, they're not going to castigate you because of that. They're going to say, well, you know, let me help you here. And then you may get a call two weeks later, three weeks later, and they say, hey, you know, the other week we talked about something in your life, or today I need some help with something in mine. Sure. That's the, that's the culture I believe yeah. the scriptures you know, promote, yes. though local churches struggle sometimes to adapt to that. Well, uh, let's uh, uh, let, let's define something here real quickly, okay. if we may. There's a difference between transparency mm -hmm. and open compromise. Oh, yes, sir. Because, you know, in our social media culture that we're in now, everyone is wanting you to know everything from what time they go to the bathroom to what time they <laughs> ate you know, breakfast and yeah. when they go to bed and when they're going to be on vacation. And they share with us every intimate detail of their life. And they, they act silly on camera and broadcast all of that to right. the world. And the next thing you know, people that you had confidence in years ago use the word transparency to show their carnality mm. and their quote-unquote liberty in Christ – that is not what we're talking about no, at no, all. No, no, no. Not that's foolishness is what that's called. Well, it, yeah, it's, it's compromise. And, mm -hmm. and basically what it, it is doing is taking your quote-unquote Christian liberty and thumbing it in the nose of people yeah. that don't have your quote-unquote liberty, which is antithetical to what the Apostle Paul told the Corinthian church Absolutely. about Christian liberty. And I don't know why these boys don't bring that up, but they don't want it brought up either. Mm -hmm. No, they yeah. don't. What do you think about transparency, Brother Matthew? I know that you gave us a story a while ago. Kind of relate that to us, if you would. Yes, sir. We, I was preaching one Sunday, and uh, I was dealing with the subject of discipline, by how you got to discipline yourself. And I used it far as the, the thought about how your flesh mm -hmm. is, is – got to discipline your flesh because your flesh don't want to pray. Your flesh don't want to do its daily Bible reading. Your flesh don't want to do its devotion time. And so I made mention of that from the pulpit one Sunday morning about disciplining your flesh. And um, not saying I struggle with that issue, though I do. I wouldn't be in all like, you know, that's my sin. That's what I'm struggling with. But I had a gentleman call me, and uh, he told me, said, Preacher, you too transparent in the pulpit. said, uh, we don't want, you're our pastor. We don't need to know that you're not reading your Bible and you're not praying. I said, that's not what I said. Hmm. I said that you got to discipline your flesh to do those types of things because your flesh don't want to. Right. right. And so that bothered me. Did I did I make a mistake? Was I too transparent? And so I called a few families together and I began to talk to the families in the church. Matter of fact, one of them was the deacon and deacon's wife and me and my wife and another family and 
I called him in the office and I said, "Do you feel like I was too transparent? Did I did I overstep? Do I need to do I need to come back next Sunday and publicly from the pulpit make you know say what you know? Do I need to apologize?" And they said, "No, preacher." Said, "You're not going." Said, "I'm going to tell you this because while you was preaching and you you made those statements about discipline your flesh and said that helped me because I thought I was the only one struggled." With not wanting to pray, not wanting to get in my secret place, not wanting to do my daily Bible reading, yeah. not wanting to do my devotions, and it bothered me because I thought, was I too transparent? Was was I too serious? But Doctor Dex read the text a while ago, and that's the text that I read in James five, and in verse number seventeen, he said, "Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months." Right. And so Elijah prayed that God would shut the heavens up. He prayed that. They would be rain, but Elijah was under the juniper tree, right. discouraged right. in his ministry. He, you know, they put that death warrant out on him. Said that uh, we're going to kill him for tomorrow, and he's under the juniper tree, asking God to take his life because he felt he was the long ranger. He's the only one left. Everybody else has bowed their knee to Baal, and but Elijah prayed, and the Bible said rain came after three and a half years. Right. Well, when you look at Elijah in that text, I believe it's First Kings chapter number nineteen, you'll see Elijah exhibiting, and you have to understand now the Holy Spirit of God. God inspired the writer of First Kings to write down the difficulty of Elijah's life. In other words, God made Elijah's life transparent for all of the Christian world to see. And the reason for that is so that we understand he he felt our infirmities. He he was a man subject to like passions as we are, right. as the scripture says in verse 17 of James 5, mm -hmm. that term subject to like passions as we are just simply means he's made out of the same stuff I'm made out yes. of. He is a son of Adam. He's a son of Eve. And he has the same Adamic nature within him that I have in me and the struggles that he had, uh, I have as well. And if you look at First uh, Kings chapter number 19, he was exhibiting characteristics of an individual who was dealing with chronic uh, clinical depression, and uh, he, he was falling prey to it. And yet the Lord allowed us to see that in his yes, life and then allowed us to see how powerful he was being affectionate and fervent in his prayer. How about it, Brother Michael? Here's the thing about it. Whenever you think about <clears throat> a parable that come to my mind about the honor or dishonor of implementing this in your life and being, being transparent about yourself, whenever the two men went down to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a publican, the Pharisee, no doubt probably in this case, acts like most Baptists. He stood up in church that day, and he'd have a bit of problem confessing the publican's faults. Right. Right? The publican stands up. Do you think he knew that the Pharisee had some holes in his life? You better believe he sure did. Sure he did. He knew the hypocrisy and everything else. He didn't waste his time confessing him his issues because he was so concentrating on his own. And so he stands up that day and confesses, you know, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that man goes down to his house justified. Right. The Pharisee stayed in that same prideful look at everybody's state. And I want to talk to the, to the people listening today to this podcast. There are some of you that will hear this, that this is the issue that you need to grab hold of to grant victory in your life. And here's why that is for. You stay so bent out of shape over the, the blights and the holes you can see in everybody else's life. It's preachers, people you go to church with, all, and these are all injustices. But what you're missing is this, is that it's like Isaiah. I mentioned this earlier. Woe unto this, woe, 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 woe. All the woes of Isaiah until you get to chapter 6 and he says, woe, woe is me. me. The glory of God is what is seen next in the chapter by Isaiah. And he did not see that until he started looking at himself, himself. and dealing with himself. So uh, it's like the day we're living in. There's so much, uh, I guess you could say, discontentment. People aren't satisfied with their preacher. They're not satisfied with their church. They're hyper offended, blah, 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 blah. Every one of these people that live in that kind of realm suffer from a lack of being real with themselves. Right, right. They're never real with anybody else, and they're not real about themselves, even to themselves. Do you find people trying to change their locations to correct their glitches in their self? They do that, and, and, and here's what they do. They send smoke screens. How many people do you know that are switching churches because of doctrinal issues? None. Almost rarely ever. 
It's always personalities, which shows, I'm yeah. getting in trouble here, it shows your immaturity. Right. Mm-hmm. Most people who find so much fault in everybody else, they don't realize it's not those people that are really the issue. It's your immaturity to be able to coexist in a scriptural realm with those people. Right. You're actually the person like in Romans 14 that have got, you know, you you think your 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 level of spirituality is the highest, but in reality it's much lower than those people whose issues you saw because if they're dealing with those issues, if they're trying to humbly walk with God, they're going to come out better down the road than you are. Right. Right. But yeah, I do I find I, th- I think and this would really kill some people to hear this. Some, the reason some people can never settle or be satisfied in in their local place of worship is because of their spiritual immaturity. Right. They think that they are mature, therefore they see all these things, but what they don't realize is that you're blinded by your own pride yes. and self-righteousness. Right. That's why you suffer the way you do. Right. You know what I'm saying? I mean, what is it going to be like, Brother Andy, for me to stand before God and and say, you know, uh, Brother Andy's got such and so uh, in his life, and that's why I couldn't coexist with him. And the Lord looked back at me and say, well, that Andy, Brother Andy does have that, but what about these five things that you have? Yeah, in that your you, life. Yeah, in your life. Uh, and it's just, it, it, pride is nasty. We yeah. all suffer from it from time to time, including myself. I, I admit that. Um, man, the older you get in, in, in the Word, and the more mature you get in the Word, if a righteous man falls seven times, then guess what? It's going to happen. Yeah. And sometimes you're going to see it if nobody else does. But hang on a minute. If, 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 if mercy is given back to me the way I give it, then I want to give it. Oh, absolutely. If it's going to be measured back to me again. Now, we're not even talking about qualifications. No, no. But the three men sitting at this table. We're just being Christian. We're friends. Every one of us probably right now could write down an area of that needs improvement or flaw in each other's lives. Right? Right. We're still friends. That's right. And we still get together, coexist, iron sharpening iron, enjoying one of those companies. Do you think that people try to reveal the skeletons in another person's life to keep from theirs being uncovered? There's a lot of that that goes on. I'm going to tell you something I have discovered in my short 15 years of pastoring. There's a lot of people that say they want a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church and preacher until they find one. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then when it's time to be a Bible-believing church and practice Bible-believing things... There's not so many people that want that ship as possible. I found that most people that make that statement are surface believers. Yes. They they believe in the big things. They they want the big things to be right, but when it boils down to the inner man and the inner sins, that's where they have the issue. Yeah. I have found that I have found that people talk the big game about what they want, but then when you make the hard decisions and the hard stands, watch the decisions <laughs> they make that follow. Yeah. And you'll find out that some people uh, this thing of being close to the Lord and they're being going. Bible believing, yeah. it's a facade. Yeah, they're going. It sounds good, looks good on a t-shirt or a bracelet. But when it comes time to live it out, yep. not the same. Yeah, I've seen that same exact yep. thing for sure. Um, what about the? What do you see, brother Matthew, in regard to? I mean, you're young in the ministry, but the young men that you're coming up around, um, you know, let's say thirty five years and younger. Um, what are you seeing in them as far as this subject of transparency or? Are they, for the most part, uh, transparent, overly transparent, not transparent at all? How would you pretty much gauge the young men that are coming on? I don't think they're transparent at all, really. I mean, because they're you, – you see them on social media, and then you, you hear them preach, and it's like it's almost two different people. And so they're like what we talked about, like a hypocrite, hypocrisy. And uh, so uh, you, you sit back and we think about the, the generations of preachers that are coming in behind us. And uh, we, we had done a podcast uh, uh, last week on uh, Vance Havner, and we talked about uh, getting these younger men uh, hooked up with some of, the, some of the literature or some of the things that Vance Havner has that you can read and listen to. And I think that's where we need to get to. We need to, my generation, we get saved. We announce our call to preach. We preach in a few pulpits, maybe even candidate for church. We already know more now than the ones we're coming behind that's been pastoring 20 and 30 years. Is, I don't know if that's the kind of question you were just asking me, but that's yeah. kind of what was on my heart when you asked me that. Like when I first started preaching, I thought I knew it all. 
now after I've been preaching and passion, I realize I don't I don't know nothing now. Right. But that's just the mentality I had when I first started when I first got saved and I first started preaching, first started studying. I'm the only one that's seen that. I'm I'm the only one that right. You know, that's kind of the attitude. Yeah, I understand. You know. I, I think that's a I think that's a a place uh, you know kind of a transition that a a young preacher is going. To, most of them are going to have to go through that transition. You yeah. know, because you know God called me to preach. You know, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. I mean. Uh, God, God did. I mean, God, God selected me. God chose me. You know, and and there's they have to realize that not many wise, not many mighty, not many mobile, noble, yes, but God, not many mobile. <laughs> and that's a truth nowadays. You can't hardly get any of them to be mobile anymore. Uh, um, but you know, the, the God has chosen the foolish things. Yeah. You know, we're not we're not that great. You know, we're not that great of an individual. Mm-hmm. No. It's that God can work through us. I think that's the big deal. You know. Yeah. Um, what do you think? What do you think is probably one of the areas that people desire not to be transparent in? Um, I would say a lot of times, uh, speaking from an adult point of view, probably the true um, state of their marriage. I, mm. I think there's a lot of people that are well, scared. Um, to work on that relationship or just simply because uh, there's so many people that have learned to live with dysfunction. Sure. That I think that um, they're afraid, they're afraid that other, they think everybody, they don't understand the majority of our marriages are in, when you sit them beside the scriptures, they are dysfunctional. Right. And they have glaring issues. The vast majority. Yeah. And it's always a work in progress. Everybody's right. always working on it to make it better. But I do, and I, I do believe it's a place in the body of Christ where I think it's crippled with disease and it's fixable. It needs work, but you're going to have to own up that you do. We know we do a marriage conference. Yes. And um, sometimes I, I don't push it. I mean, we announce it, but sometimes it's hard to get half your church to even attend. And as a pastor, you're set back going to the, the overwhelming majority of your people could use a tweak and a twist and a turn right. and, a, and, a, and a challenge to get better. But uh, I think that's one of the areas, in my opinion, that's uh, that's one of the glaring areas. I, th- I think, too, that uh, we, we spoke about Elijah earlier, Brother Matthew did, out of uh, James 5.17. I think the emotional distress that a lot of people are going through from the pulpit to the pew is something that is um, spiritually embarrassing, uh, mm-hmm. you know, because of, you know, our lack of faith and, you know, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our, you know, feeling that if, you know, if we were these great people of faith, we would not be struggling in some of these areas. But God has given us Elijah as an example mm-hmm. of a great man who did struggle in any, I called it uh, Elijah's emotional emergency uh, that he was in. And I think there's a lot of that that goes on. And there's there's several things I think that that propagate that. I think everything from um, the, the diet uh, of an individual all the way to, um, you know, all the way to circumstances and situations that they don't handle properly are contributing factors to that. I would like to interject this. I know we're about out of time on the podcast, but I would like to say before we close and go out um, that uh, for some of our podcast family, as they listen to this, if they'll grasp the fact um, that nobody's got it all together. Right. And a little transparency with the right people and having people that will be transparent with you is good and healthy. Let me tell you why. There are some people that will hear this that have struggled and do struggle for years over being assured of their salvation because they think, well, I struggle with so-and-so and none of these people does. struggle, so I must not be saved. Stop the press. That's has right. nothing to do with it. Truth is, we all are struggling. It doesn't matter what issue exactly. you pick out. Exactly. There's, there's multiple people that are struggling. And not only that, but whatever you really were involved with or tapped into before you got saved, if you were out in the world especially, that will be something that may follow you around all your life, always trying to get its teeth in you again. No doubt. You know what I'm saying? And so, and you're going to struggle. Sometimes you're going to lose that battle occasionally. Um, and uh, But you got to realize it has nothing to do with you nothing being a believer. At all all nothing believers at all. struggle. Our lack of transparency has caused a uh, schism or a blight, let me say it that right. way, in the body of Christ. No doubt. No doubt. Yes. Well, with transparency, you must, you must... 
get some accountability. Mm -hmm. And you need to get people around you that you can trust with your life. Literally, you trust them with your life. And you're able to be transparent with them and they with you. It doesn't need to be one-sided. It needs to be Mm -hmm. two-sided. And if you'll develop those kinds of relationships, God will help you along the way. Well, we've reached the end of another podcast. And from the crew of the Higher Grounds podcast, you keep pressing on the upward way. We will see you next week. Mm -hmm.